This video is sponsored by Squarespace. What's up, everyone? Today, we're talking about Canon. Because two days ago, I made a video called Pros and Cons of Using Sony After Eight Years. And you guys seem to really like that video. It wasn't scripted. I said a million uhs and you knows because I don't know how to speak without a teleprompter. It makes it easier for me because I don't, it takes it takes forever to script the video. And I guess I, I kind of take for granted all of the experience that I have with this gear in the real world. And I guess, you know, I have, I have a lot to share. I just, I feel the pressure of YouTube and having everything needs to be perfect, you know, perfect script, B-roll and all this stuff. And I'm just like, yo, I'm gonna just talk to you like you're here, like we're, like we're, we're just sitting here having a conversation and just share some of my knowledge with y'all. I am more knowledgeable with Sony, but I have been shooting Canon for a long time. Actually, I started my photography career using Canon. I started with the Canon T3. I feel a lot of us did. T3 or T3i. Then I went to the Fighting Mark II because Digital Rev, you know, Kai is at the time, that's who I watched. When I, then I went to the Nikon D600, which was a nice bump in image quality, dynamic range, but they had the oil spot issue. And then Nikon didn't acknowledge it right away and I got kind of mad. So then, before even the recall came out, I sold it, and then I ended up getting the Fighting Mark III, and I was on, I was using that until, and I was shooting weddings until I got to uh, Sony, and then that's when I started doing the whole YouTube thing. But I've been shooting Canon for like four years straight, all the newest cameras, so I have pretty good experience. Here I have the Canon R7 and the R10. I was part of the launch there, so I have a lot of experience with those cameras. And then here is the new R6 Mark II, and my baby, the Canon R5, which I think to this day this is could be like the per still the perfect camera. Like for, especially for me, I think that this camera just got a bad rap out the gate because of the, you know, the, the overheating stuff. And man, this camera is so, I love the R5. And here is the R3, of course, which is my dedicated sports camera. This camera is still the king of autofocus. And I'll explain to you why later. So like the Sony video, we're gonna start off with the good first. And the first thing that I think Canon does extremely well is ergonomics. Canon makes some of the best feeling cameras on the planet. I think Nikon is right up there too. I do like how their cameras feel, the Z67, even the Z9. These cameras are meant for photographers. Go like this to a Canon camera, rub your hand around it, it's soft. There's like the edges, there's no like sharp points. And you know, just the placement, even the shutter, the slant here where your finger sits and even where the, the thumb rest, it's like perfect for the human hand. It feels amazing. And even smaller cameras like the R7, where it's a smaller body, they still made the grip nice and big so that you don't have any fingers dangling. That's what Canon does and knows. They know how to make cameras that feel good and feel comfortable for a long day of shooting. I could shoot all day with these things. So that's one reason why I love picking up Canon cameras. Another huge reason is for the ease of use. And I know that a lot of people say this on the internet. I'm gonna break that down a little bit. One thing that I just absolutely love is how you're able to adjust your exposure settings like shutter speed, aperture, ISO from the rear touchscreen. This is something you can't do on Sony. And I operate the camera like this all the time when I'm shooting off of the rear screen. Another part of the reason is for the menu system. Okay, so I'm familiar with Sony's menu system and Nikon. When you're looking for something on the in the Canon menu system, it's easier to find. It, things are just it's like the iPhone of cameras, right? In terms of usability, it's very straightforward. You don't have a ton of customization options, but you know, you have just enough, just what you need. So if you go in the menu system and you just go sideways and you know how many tabs there are, how many different options, there's around 30 different ones on the Canon. On the Sony with the new menu system, there's around 50 different tabs, okay, that you can go from and choose from. And then Nikon with at least the Z9, it's crazy. 130 different tabs. And that was one of my my cons of the Z9 when I reviewed it was that the menu system is so it's so intimidating when trying to find something because there is there are options for everything and that could be a good thing but in the real world when you're using the camera sometimes that can get in the way having just too many options Canon keeps it simple they give you what you need and it's easy to find to make an adjustment in the menu system. And that's one thing I like about Canon is that you can just focus on the craft, focus on what you're doing. While on the topic of ergonomics, I do need to highlight something about this camera right here, the R3, okay? So first of all, most of Canon cameras, 
almost all of them have flip screens, which is great for hybrid shooters. So these cameras are, are really geared toward the 2022 photographer because everyone does a little bit of video nowadays or most people do video and having flip screens is very helpful for video, especially for creators like myself. Head up, head up a little higher. Yes. But I do have to just a shout out to Canon for, for like, you know, never count Canon out. Sometimes they make some suspect choices like with the, the thumb pad on the EOS R, you know, they're experimenting with that. But one thing they did with the R3, man, this camera is big, but it doesn't weigh big or it doesn't weigh like a big camera. It's very deceiving. It almost feels like it's empty. Like there's nothing in here because it's so light. I mean, look at, I'm just holding at the tip of my fingers. Unlike the Z9 where it's a, it's a tank. This thing is powerful, but look at how light it is. So let's talk about image quality. And this one is gonna be interesting because it's not as simple and straight to the point as it was for Sony. Recently, I posted a video where I compared the Sony A7R, the original one from 2013, and compared it to the one, the A7R5 that came out this year. And that's nine years of innovation. And what I learned was that, yes, image quality has gotten slightly better, but it hasn't gotten that much better, at least on the Sony side, right? Because they started off with a non-BSI sensor, the same one that was in the Nikon D800. And then the, cam the sensors went BSI and then those it, it, image quality tapered off at a certain point, right? It's only gotten so good. Dynamic range has only gotten so high. But with Canon, however, it has changed. There has been a big improvement from the old days, like when I shot with the Fighting Mark III, and even I would say with the EOS R, the first mirrorless camera, it still struggled with highlights and shadows and clipping and didn't have much dynamic range. So a couple months ago, what I did is I compared the R10, the R5 and the R3 in the studio. I took a portrait of Laura with each camera just to see if I could see a difference, almost like a blind test for myself. And other than the white balance shift that I noticed across all cameras, I zoomed in 200%. And to be honest, like I could, I could barely tell which camera was which, which is saying something about modern sensors nowadays, even if it's a $1,000 camera, you put a good lens in front of that center, good lighting, you're gonna get some really good results. The Canon R5 is one of the few sensors that Canon has made that I would say, or that, I've, that I've used that compares to Sony and Canon. I mean, I think they're literally the same in terms of file flexibility and just overall, just how good it is. And what's crazy is that it's not, this is not a BSI sensor. Canon, Canon's only BSI sensor right now in the mirrorless space is the Canon R3. This is a BSI stacked sensor. R5 is not stacked, but man, the performance of this camera is, I put it up against anything else out there. So I mostly shoot in the studio nowadays and I've always noticed that I get very consistent skin tones with Canon. Canon definitely leans a little bit more magenta, but it just looks more natural, you know, versus Sony where Sony straight out of camera leans a little bit more yellow and green. This camera just, its output is beautiful. It's consistent. And I've always been a fan of Canon skin tones. It's very neutral, magenta-ish, true to life. And I think that's one of the huge strong suits of shooting Canon. Although many people will argue that the mirrorless color science isn't the same as the DSLR, that it's kind of changed and people prefer the DSLR. I haven't directly tested it, but let me know if you've noticed the difference between um, DSLR and mirrorless. Another huge strong suit, but also very controversial part of Canon are the lenses. We're gonna get into the controversial part later, but their strategy on, on glass is very interesting. They came out with a bang. They came out with the sexy glass, the 8512, the 28 to 70 F2, which no one else makes. And in the mirrorless space, no one else makes an 8512. I don't care what you say. If I could just pick one lens out of any mirrorless system, and I could just pick one, it would be the 8512. I don't care about its size. This thing is straight up magic. And they also just announced the 135 millimeter 1.8, which I also was there in San Diego to use. And that leads me to kind of in my second point for lenses is that most of their lenses have IBIS built in, which Nikon doesn't really do that. And Sony doesn't do that. Sony just goes more for like small, lightweight, and they just, you know, 
you rely on the IBIS in the body. Canon definitely tries their best to put IBIS into anything that they can, which also can work against it in a bit because when you get like 15 to 35 f 2.8, 2470 2.8, you're not getting a smaller lens. They all have IBIS, so they're all gonna be kind of big and chunky. Another unique thing about Canon lenses are these pancake lenses, like the 518 and 16 millimeter f 2.8. And what I love about this is that these are truly compact lenses. Yeah, they're not like the greatest performing lenses, but I mean, a lens like this, you can carry, it doesn't take any space in your camera bag. If you wanna travel light, this is amazing. On the R7, this 16 millimeter is a 24 millimeter. And look at how small and compact this setup is. Or you could put this on a Canon R5 or a full frame and you get that super wide 16 millimeter with a respectable F2.8. Ooh, autofocus, this is gonna be a good one. So the autofocus of Canon cameras have always been good. I would say that Canon is still slightly better than Sony right now, or at least the R3 is, okay? The R3 is the best autofocusing camera, even better than the A7R5 with the AI autofocus. And, but, you know, I have to explain myself when I say that though, okay? So first, the Canon R5 is still competes with any of the best of cameras when it comes to the autofocus. It's really good, really predictable autofocus. The R6 Mark II is insane. The way it places boxes over everything and sizes everything up, it's insane. The only thing with the R6 Mark II, it's a little bit more fidgety, a little bit more unpredictable sometimes. It, it's, a, it's really aggressive. But what I really wanna do is talk about the R3's autofocus and why it's so special. So one thing on the internet, a lot of people don't talk about the eye control. And people that have never heard about that, this is not eye autofocus, this is eye control where I can look in here and I can control the point with my eyeball. So when I look this way, it goes that way. It goes that way, you know, it follows your eyeball. It doesn't work for everyone, you have to calibrate it, but it works good for me. And the thing is that it doesn't have to be super precise. It doesn't have to be perfect. So I shoot Major League Baseball every now and then, well, when the season was here. And on, let's say, for example, I'm on the first base side of the field and there's a guy on third base, the pitcher's on the right side of the frame and the runner's on the left side of the frame, right? Looking at the pitcher. If I'm in wide area AF with the camera, it's gonna go straight to the pitcher, right? Cause he's right there in the frame and depending on what lens I have and the depth of field, if it's like a 400 to eight, um, it's gonna go to the pitcher most likely cause the guy's gonna be blurred out. So I would have to, you know, take command of my focusing points. Not a big deal, right? Just use the focusing point and slide it over to the person uh, that's on third, take a picture of him. If I wanna go back to the pitcher, just move my focusing point back or go center focusing point and just take a picture of the pitcher, then the guy and then the pitcher again. But with the Canon R3, all I, I, don't, I don't even have to move my camera and I don't even have to change auto focusing modes. I leave it in wide. I can just look, frame up my shot. All I gotta do is look in the vicinity, right? In the area of the guy behind the pitcher on third, just look his way. The, it doesn't have to be perfectly on him, but once I have pressed the shutter, it's gonna find whatever's in that area and it'll grab him. Boom, got him, take a picture. Almost instantly, I let go of the shutter and I could just look over to the picture and then the little white circle goes to the picture, half press, and then it'll focus on the picture instantly. You, it's impossible to do this faster, doing it this way or moving your focusing point. The last thing that I really want to highlight with Canon cameras that stand out to me are the screen quality. And I talk a lot about screen quality because I think that I get spoiled when I use a Canon. Although this screen is a 2.1 million dot screen, the same as the new A7R5, 2.1 million dot, there is, it, the number does not do it justice. Canon screens have always been better. And I, Canon shooters know what I'm talking about. When you take a picture on it, when a Canon, the image looks better on the back screen than it does in a computer. It looks edited, it looks it looks beautiful. Like you can just go to somebody and show them like a photo that you took, it's a banger. The camera reflects that. They're like, whoa, you know, it looks, it looks beautiful on this back screen. With Sony, it doesn't look as good. It doesn't look as crisp, it doesn't look as colorful. And I'm usually telling them to look in EVF. Here, look in there, look in there, you know, to get a more of a, see how good it is. Before we get into the cons, I wanna give my sponsor a shout out, and that is Squarespace. If you have been looking to start a website, blog, or an online store, you need to check them out ASAP. 
Every entrepreneur needs a website, and with Squarespace, you don't need to have any kind of graphic design skills to start. It's so easy to use. You have 24-7 customer support. If you ever get bored of the look, you can choose from a bunch of pre-made templates and switch everything up at a click of a button. You can also start your own online store like I did where I sell my Lightroom presets and my retouching tutorial to make some passive income. If you wanna check them out for yourself, use the coupon code Manny and you'll get 10% off your first purchase. It's time. Let's discuss the cons, things that I wish Canon would improve. We're gonna start off with the third party lenses, the elephant in the room. That's probably the biggest con or the biggest problem with Canon right now. When I was in San Diego with Canon and for the R6 Mark II launch, I had the privilege of sitting literally at dinner with some of the product managers at Canon and I voiced my concerns. I voiced them. I I'm very vocal about like this whole mount thing. I, I just think that I think it is a mistake for many different reasons. But at the same time, who am I to, you know, kind of question, obviously they know what they're doing, but from a consumer standpoint, because at the end of the day, I'm one of y'all. Like we're, we're in the same, you know, like I can be a voice for everyone. I think that I am against it for many reasons, but we all started somewhere. And we know that not everyone started using red ringed lenses. Most, most everybody started with a third party lens on their camera. It changes people's decision. Like some people that want to go to Canon or back to Canon from Sony, they don't want to do it now because man, it's a huge investment. It's a, it's a huge just entry investment. And for people that are looking to, let's say maybe start using Canon, they got the R7 and the R10, which are you know under $2,000. But now what lenses are you going to get for it? It never gave me a specific answer you know, I think they, I think they understand. I think they understand what the people want, right? I think that it's something that they're going to eventually have to address. Maybe I've, so I've actually heard Jared talk about like, well, they may not want crappy third party manufacturers. And I'm assuming he's talking about other companies like Viltrox and Samyang to make lenses for their mount and for them to perform bad. But I, then I also heard Taylor Jackson when he was using the R, he was using the R3 he shot wedding, so he, you need to have a good performing lens. And he, one of his favorite lenses was the Viltrox 8518, and Taylor Jackson did say that. So that leads me to believe that maybe it's not a quality, maybe it's not a quality control thing. Maybe it's something that we'll just never understand, or maybe it's just pure business. I don't know what it is. They need to open up the mount because Sigma and Tamron are making some really good freaking glass which is still the biggest reason to shoot Sony nowadays because cameras are getting so good. It's all coming down to ergonomics and lenses to really differentiate these cameras. So that's where, that's where Sony is really, really powerful in. They may be losing some business on the, on the lens side because people are buying third party, but people are buying their camera bodies because of those lenses. I'm going to just leave it there. But I think that's one of the biggest obstacles when choosing Canon over anybody else right now at this moment. One of the other things that I don't like about Canon, this one's on the video side, it's the wide angle wobble. And I know that a lot of YouTube creators talk about this, even Peter McKinnon, and he was linked up with Canon. I don't know if he is anymore because he's talking about Leica now, but he's even talked about it. And how can you not? Like it's very evident when you put a wide angle lens on one of these cameras, you get that wide angle, those corners are dancing. Okay, they're, they're, they're really dancing. And I don't know what it, what it could take to fix that. Another negative thing that affects Canon cameras is overheating. The R, as good as the R5 is, and as much as I love this camera, man, this camera got such a bad rap in the beginning for the overheating in video that everyone kind of overlooked how good of a photography camera this is. The overheating kind of stole the show. And to their credit, after all the firmware updates, this camera is very usable for professional video. So I haven't used it myself, but my friend who also does video for me, Rob, when we were in San Diego, he shot one day with the R6 and one day with the R5. He, the R6 would overheat on him. The original R6 would overheat. But the second day he was shooting a lot of 4K, 60, 4K, 120 with the R5 and did not overheat. I think that it makes this camera, again, more of a versatile, powerful tool. It's already such an amazing camera and I'm glad that they took care of the overheating with the firmware updates, but the R6 still does, I think. Yeah, the R6 still does. And Tony and Chelsea, so they used to have R6s in their studio and they switched to Sony because of the overheating on the R6.
Another thing that I don't like about Canon cameras, and again, one of the reasons why I don't shoot video with Canon and I mostly shoot Sony is because a lot of their cameras have uh, C-Log3 and they don't have C-Log2. C-Log3 for me, maybe I just need more time with C-Log3. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of C-Log3. I think that it doesn't have the dynamic range that I'm used to with my Sony cameras like the A7S3, FX3. There's a ton of dynamic range with S-Log3. C-Log3 doesn't have that much dynamic range and I have more trouble color grading it, but that's mostly a user error kind of thing, right? Because I, I just haven't had enough time with it, but I just wish that it had, these had C-Log2 or at least some of the top cameras, at least like, you know, R6 Mark II and R5 would have C-Log2 where you can push those files a little bit more. And I wouldn't have such an issue with that if the standard profile was an 8-bit. So you can't shoot st straight out of the camera 10-bit video. And I do like the straight out of camera video coming out of this thing, but it's 8-bit. Adding to that, a quick one is the micro HDMI situation that we have going on with Canon. Every one of these cameras here, $6,000, $4,000, We've got nothing but micro HDMI here. With Sony, we've got full HDMI on uh, almost all their new cameras. So, so the last thing that I'm gonna nitpick on with Canon, let's say like the R5 straight out of the box to get from photo to video, you gotta do, you gotta press two buttons. You gotta press mode and then info, and then it switches to, to, to video. And that to me was always just so like clunky, a clunky way of switching, you know? The R6 Mark II fixed it, and now we have this dial in the end here, which is awesome. But I have a hack for you, and it's even better than any other Sony. It's better than any camera out there, um, and you could do it with the R5. The function button right up here, right next to the shutter, this little button here, you can actually map it to switch from photo and video. And it's again, it's faster than any other camera because it's right next to the shutter. All you gotta go is doop, press it, and it quickly switches from photo to video. I'm glad they're fixing it. I'm glad they're addressing it. They, that's a big improvement with the new design of the, the R6 Mark II. It's the little things. And the on and off switch here is growing on me because it's all one hand that I could just, with one hand, I don't gotta go with two hands, you know? Like, I actually actually like it now. If it's natural, it's like right where your index finger is. One finger, just go whoop, pop it on. So I kind of like that. Okay, so now that I went over the good and bad, I just want to reflect a little bit on all the things that I just said. Um, I think that the pros and the good things about Canon cameras far outweigh the negative things. Of course, that's just me being nitpicky, just like I did with Sony. I'm just keeping it real. But at the end of the day, I mean, what Canon is doing, like I never, I'll never count out Canon ever again. Like when the EOS R came out and again, it was a good camera, but it clearly had flaws. And then they come out with the, the R5 that was, it's ahead of its time. This camera is ahead of its time. And the fact that it came out a couple of years ago and it still holds its own against any other camera out there right now says a lot. I would have absolutely zero issues switching to a camera like the R5 as my main shooter because it's that good with the 8512 and the R3 again. This is this is a camera that um you know I feel like doesn't get enough I guess I don't know respect doesn't get talked about enough because this is like a real piece of innovation here. All right. So now we're at that point guys. You already know what kind of you know what time this is. All right. So how do I close out the video? I still haven't thought about a way to close it out. I read some of your comments on it. I gotta find like a mantra. I gotta find like a, a cool way of ending my videos. But let me let me give it a shot here. Uh, you know, uh, okay, that doesn't work. All right, so that is all that I, okay. All right, that is all that I have for you. Okay, so that is going to conclude. Let's see, oh boy. You know what, actually, instead of, why am I making this so hard? I could just plug my products instead, all right? Okay. So if you appreciate what I, okay, for real though, if you made it up to this point, you're listening to me right now, I, I appreciate you um, for watching this entire video and just caring about what I have to say. That that honestly just means a lot because I, I don't know, sometimes I'm like, why, like what's my purpose, you know? But I appreciate it. Also, if you do appreciate what I do here on YouTube, I would appreciate if you could, you know, a way of supporting me, but also getting some nice presets for yourself. As you, as you see, like I do a lot of photography, I'm always out doing it, and I use my presets to color grade my images. The Walmart Drake preset pack is probably my favorite one. 
Uh, I got the film pack, which is great for, you know, at giving your images a little bit more of a muted film look. Starbucks is the best for skin tones on that one. And then I have a golden hour preset pack, which, boy, that one's probably my favorite. It's really nice for making your images, giving them that golden hour look, making them warm. But I'm telling you, it's some really good presets in there that I personally use that I've been actually using for years before I, um, I sold them. So, and then I also have a retouching tutorial. So if you wanna support what I do here, check those out. Link will be down below. I appreciate you and I will see you in 2023.